On the agenda this evening is Golden Ridge Subdivision and Carew Subdivision Amendment, and I believe we'll be discussing the possibility of changing the order of those two agenda items. First order of business is the minutes from last month's meeting, which we all have before us. Are there any changes or corrections to those minutes? Mr. Chairman, I just have a very minor correction on the last page. The minutes reflect that I made a motion to adjourn. I, I believe it should be somebody else since I wasn't here. <laughs> you don't want credit for that? <laughs> I usually make those motions, so it's understandable that you would have put my name. Uh, thank you. I actually believe that was me. Okay. Secretary could make that correction. <laughs> Do I hear a motion on the minutes as amended? So moved. Second. Motion to accept the minutes as amended and made and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? unanimous. While there was no correspondence with our packets that arrived uh, prior to tonight's meeting, we do have a couple of things that came on the desk before us tonight. One is a letter to the Planning Board from the Conservation Commission regarding the Golden Ridge subdivision, a statement of financial capability regarding Golden Ridge, and a Planning Board schedule for 2004. Now, the First scheduled item is Golden Ridge, but I believe that somebody would like to discuss an alteration to that. Mr. Sherman. Mr. Chairman, I would uh, like to move that we suspend the rules uh, for this evening and take the items in reverse order because it appears that the Carew subdivision amendment may be relatively brief uh, as far as how much time it's going to take. So I would, ask, or would request that we uh, or move that we reverse the order. I'll, so, I'll second that motion. And I'd point out to the other board members that we did discuss this with the, both applicants, and that was okay with them, too. All in favor? So moved. First item tonight will then be Carew subdivision. Do we have an applicant? Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the applicant for Golden Ridge subdivision for allowing me to, to go first. Um, my name is John Mitchell of Mitchell & Associates, and I represent uh, Candace Carew and Jack Pilk uh, for the proposed Carew subdivision. Uh, if the board remembers, last June uh, they, they approved a three-lot subdivision located at 246 Ocean House Road, a three-lot clustered uh, subdivision. And we're before you this evening to request uh, two amendments. The first amendment is a phasing plan. Um, and as, as, shown on the, as shown on the revised plan, lot one, lot two, and all of the common open space uh, would be included as phase one. Phase two would consist of lot three in the rear portion of the proposed room. Uh, this will, <coughs> phase one would consist of uh, the construction of uh, the front portion of Arlington Lane. Uh, this will allow access to both lots one and two, uh, as well as providing a uh, a turnaround for emergency vehicles. Uh, included in the phase one would be uh, phasing the utilities. Uh, the sanitary sewer would can, uh, extend to the end of the proposed phase one road. The uh, water would extend to approximately 100 feet uh, to this point, which will allow service to lot one. Uh, lot two already has uh, public service. And the electric telephone and cable would extend, uh, as you remember, during the approval uh, of the subdivision, we are relocating the above ground utilities to below ground, underground. Uh, so the electric, underground electric telephone and cable would extend to uh, the existing residents as well as to lot one. Uh, the remainder of Arlington Lane, which is approximately 170 feet, as well as the, uh, the balance of the utilities, would be constructed upon issuance of a building permit for Phase 2. 
and we've included a note on the revised plan to that effect the second amendment request is a land we have delineated a strip of land on the easterly boundary of the subdivision of 3,300 square feet to be conveyed to the easterly abutter and the purpose of this conveyance is that there is an encroachment of the pond onto the Karoo property and by conveying the strip of land it will get the entire pond onto his land and as we indicated in our submission package this reduces the amount of open space of the subdivision from 53.3% to 52.3% which is far in excess of the minimum 40% required by ordinance so that is that is an overview of the two requests two amendment requests thank you just point out to members of the board that since this is an approved subdivision there's no completeness determination required it's really just a matter of evaluating this this modification so it's open for discussion at this point yes sir I have a question of Maureen has anybody called on this issue have you received any correspondence or anything no one's called no one's written in that case I don't think that I would think that the need for a site walk or any further discussion I don't have any questions other than that one Mr. Mitchell the with the exception of the phasing should lot 3 be developed and the road and utilities be extended in its final form the subdivision would be no different from the current approval with the exception of that small parcel carved out at the back that's correct so it's really just timing not the actual construction or layout of the subdivision it's the owner has gone into an agreement with the abutter the easterly abutter to purchase or sell this lot 3 and the only difference is that the easterly abutter will have to pay the land tax and the abutter will have to pay the land tax and the purpose the Chinchettes want it for additional buffer or to add to their open space so it's it's very unlikely that lot 3 will be developed in the foreseeable future and hence why develop the road Mr. Mitchell that strip of land that includes the portion of the pond is going to remain subject to the conservation easement that it was already subject to in the original yes it will yes any other questions anyone care to make a motion make a motion for the board to consider findings of fact Candace Carew is requesting changes to the subdivision located at 246 Ocean House Road to phase the construction and convey 3,300 square feet to an abutter which requires review under section 16-2-5 amendment to previously approved subdivision the application substantially complies with section 16-2-5 of the subdivision ordinance therefore be it ordered that based on the plans and the materials submitted and the facts presented the application of Candace Carew for amendments to the previously approved Carew subdivision located at 246 Ocean House Road to phase the subdivision and convey 3,300 square feet of land to an abutter be approved Mr. Chairman I'd like to second that motion motion has been made and seconded any further discussion all in favor opposed motion is unanimous thank you very much
Next item on the agenda is Golden Ridge Subdivision. Thank you again to the applicant for allowing us to uh, switch the order of the agenda. <clears throat> K and K Realty is requesting minor subdivision review of a three-lot subdivision located on Golden Ridge Lane. This application will be reviewed for compliance with Section 16-2-3, Minor Subdivision Review. As a refresher, this application came before us last month and was deemed incomplete. Tonight we are going to once again address completeness. Uh, should completeness be found, then we've scheduled a public hearing for this evening and we can follow the public hearing with discussion and uh, potential determination of the application itself. So, Mr. Fisher, if you would please uh, bring us up to date on what's changed since last month. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, essentially, I believe, the, uh, and I'll defer to the planner, but I believe that the, uh, the completion is indeed just that, uh, that everything is complete on this particular project. What I'd like to do is give a very brief orientation, uh, not uh, dwelling too much in the interest of brevity, and then focus on a couple of issues that uh, are still outstanding items of interest as far as the board is concerned. Essentially, we have a uh, request for a final proposal or final approval of a three lot minor subdivision located at the end of Golden Ridge Lane. Golden Ridge Lane is a uh, roadway that does currently exist. On this plan, as you can see it here, it's highlighted in yellow. Um, the plans that you have are actually the, uh, the roadway is the entire stretch right down here. What we propose to do is improve that road to uh, town standards. However, it will stay as it's shown on the plan. We do not intend to move it other than within the right of way to slightly in, in conjunction with its approvals. We have three lots identified as lot A, B, and C, the remaining property. Uh, the first lot is uh, sold to uh, Amy Powell, who is an immediate butter in this section. Uh, this lot, belong, lot B, belongs to uh, Stephen Wesley Young, and the remaining lands are that of KF King for Realty, which are the Kennedys. What I've done as far as the series of plans are concerned is, uh, just for, for an orientation, there's a match line that you have on your plans. Uh, this match line corresponds to this match line, which is the rest of this property right here. So we're looking at the property in its entirety from this section through here, picking it up again here, and over to this point. Uh, we have uh, sheet 404, which is a difference uh, from what you had last time. This is an addition to the plan set. This is regarding the details for the proposed relocation of the Greenbelt Trail, which I'll get to in just a moment. Uh, you have that in your packet as well, along with our suggestions, uh, in addition to the planting details and what have you. Finally, we have the engineering specifications that the uh, town's reviewing engineer have gone through. Uh, as I believe a standard item of, of con uh, condition for approval is uh, that we adhere to all the reviewing engineer's comments, which we have done, but that's in conjunction with the, approval, the uh, plan set that we submitted uh, three weeks ago. Uh, Steve, uh, the uh, town's engineer will then get back to us uh, as far as having met all of his criteria which is shown on these plans. We do have a couple of issues that uh, I would like to focus on, and we can do that now or after any other uh, questions regarding the subdivision itself. Those two issues are, again, the green belt, uh, as you see here. And this is the highlighted section, which I'll explain here in just a moment. And uh, then the issue of uh, open space criteria regarding the um, property as a whole. And that open space uh, pertains specifically to the remaining lands, which is Lot C, which is depicted in its entirety on this, on this particular plan. First of all, as far as the, uh, the green belt, well, are there any other questions, or are there any questions or comments about the subdivision itself and the other issues beyond the green belt or the open space criteria that I can address at this point? And we're certainly open to anything that will come up throughout the process. Okay. Uh, as far as the green belt is concerned, this has become uh, somewhat of an item of contention, and we certainly don't want it to be so. In essence, what we have, uh, there is a current portion of the town's green belt which currently burdens the property, and that of the Hagmans, Powell's, uh, Powell lot up here, and then connecting into the Sprague easement, which you see back here. The physical location of this uh, easement, as it currently exists, is right in this section, right on Bowery Beach Road, which is Highway 77. Uh, it is posted with a green belt sign. It does come back, coincides with the drainage easement that comes back between these two properties, this being Hagman and Powell, follows through the, uh, the Powell property in this particular section here and then connects to uh, an easement on the Sprague property, as you see right in here. The path doesn't generally follow the easement, but there are easements of record to be able to allow it to do so. What we propose, uh, given the, uh, the final approval of this subdivision, with this being a, a residential house lot, 
is to laterally move this particular easement, and the easement is a standard width of 18 feet as it currently exists, keeping it at an 18-foot easement along this section so we're not changing its uniformity, moving it laterally approximately 160 to 170 feet. It will coincide with the uh, private way, Golden Ridge Lane, which will be uh, kept as a private way. Uh, it will not, however, be one and the same, or our proposal is not to have it one and the same with the actual travel way. While it will fall within the right of way, it will be separated from the traveled way based on the information that you see on sheet 404, which details specifics regarding uh, Mr. Kennedy's acquiescence to uh, put in several sections of split rail fence, that, uh, the purpose of which will separate the pathway that he will be creating from the actual traveled way or the roadway itself, in conjunction with uh, planting several trees and bushes, planting schedule of which is uh, uh, annotated on sheet 404. So this section that you see and on your plans that's, uh, that's shaded or hatched uh, a bit is uh, the proposed relocation or that which is shown in yellow here of the actual easement itself from this section over to here. We propose to, uh, at the uh, behest of the Conservation Commission's suggestions, we will be moving the actual road sign for those of you who may have noticed on our site walk, Golden Ridge Lane, the standard uh, street sign is located here. We're gonna be moving that to the other side so that it is less apparent to anyone who would be tempted to use the Greenbelt Trail that they are actually coming down a private roadway. Uh, in conjunction with that movement of that uh, roadway sign, we also plan to um, put a, one of the, the Greenbelt signs uh, that the town has right up in front here to more clearly delineate where the entrance is and to improve this entrance to the point where it actually looks like an entrance to a pathway as opposed to kind of an entrance through the woods somewhere. Uh, so it will be very clear to anybody who would be tempted to use it uh, that this is indeed where the trail is going to start. Mr. Kennedy will also, at the behest of the Conservation Commission, uh, create that pathway. And that pathway itself, the travel portion of the pathway, will be approximately four feet wide, three to five feet wide, say. Uh, chipped wood base. We do have, at the engineer's suggestion, there are some uh, two minor crossings of the, uh, of the Golden Ridge Lane and the pathway. Uh, by a, uh, a small drainage ditch, uh, one in this section right here and then one in this section. What we have shown on the plans and conjunction with the engineering details is that the path will actually, it's culverted underneath that, so the path will actually go over the top of it. It will be high and dry the entire length. And it will proceed in uh, over 500 feet to the, this section of the turnout. This, as I understand it, with our conversations between the board, the planner, our clients, uh, the Conservation Commission and several other people uh, is not particularly an item of contention. Everybody seems to be on the same page as far as this is concerned. What is a little bit more contentious is what you see in the multicolored areas right up here. What our clients propose is to follow this yellow line to the point where it comes out into a turnout that we saw at the site a couple of weeks in, weekends ago. What we would propose then is actually the line that you would see in green. This corresponds to your original plan set that we had um, two months ago. Uh, what that does is allow us to con continue up the road and then straight over uh, adjacent to the actual property line between what is now the Young's property and what would be the Powell's property in this section. Keeping in mind again that this is an 18 foot wide tray or, or easement within which we will have the proposal of a four to five foot wide pathway or traveled way. We can put that traveled way anywhere within that easement. Uh, as I'm sure you've seen, if anybody has utilized uh, any of the um, Greenbelt trails throughout Cape in the past, the trails kind of go where the trails are going to go anyway. Uh, we will certainly create it, uh, but again, we have about 18 feet to play with it and people walking, passing each other, what have you, will have a good four or five feet of an actual cleared pathway. Uh, with no obstructions. Uh, this is our proposal at the moment. What we did have in conjunction with the original comments from the, or the feedback comments from the Conservation Commission last month was, uh, again, this did not seem to be an issue overall, but as far as this area is concerned, what they would prefer and what we have discussed, and I met with the Conservation Commission uh, three times beginning, I believe it was last January, February, early part of this year, uh, regarding the access through the easement. What they had suggested is uh, to come up to this point and then it becomes the blue line. Uh, I think several members of the commission were with us at the site walk and they had indicated as well that this is their preference. This is the southerly line of the easement that is being granted to the Sprague Corporation, which I'll get to in just a moment. 
uh, and this white space in between the two proposals is uh, 14 feet. So um, what we would, uh, an, a third proposal as it were, and this is what we would like to hash out with the board and just get the board's comments this evening, come up with a fixed uh, proposal and then uh, get final approval on that. One of the bigger contentions I think that the Conservation Com had, Commission had, rightly so, is to try to keep a green belt trail green. Keep it off of a particular roadway. We don't have an issue with that. Um, so what we did as a uh, potential compromise was to be able to come around the, uh, in sort of this s uh, situation, around the actual drive, the emergency access turnout right in here. This turnout, by the way, as it's indicated on here, will service only two lots, this, the Young's lot and the Kennedy lot. But it's certainly prudent to do it based on safety procedures and what have you. Uh, so we're willing to come up and snake around that and still come to the, the boundary line. Uh, that, as I understand it, the memo that you've seen before you this evening, um, is people understand, I think everybody understands it. Uh, the commission, as I understand it, would prefer still to have it where this blue line is. That notwithstanding, what our contention is, is that um, the relocation of the Greenbelt Trail, as we now see it, is, and we can make anything, we can say anything, we can make anything dance if we want to, but I truly believe that it is a win-win situation for just about everybody involved. Principally because the trail right now is very probably, and this is my opinion, not used to the ultimate degree that it could by members of the public. Primarily because of its access and location uh, right down a driveway that belongs to the Hagman property, which is this property right here. Then it comes between the, uh, the Powell and the Hagman's houses and comes back into an area that is uh, well maintained as lawn. It's there. Uh, it's not an issue as far as the people who do use it because it is there, certainly. But I think there's probably reticence as, uh, and I live in Cape and I use the Greenbelt Trails quite often. Again, this is my opinion. But uh, it's much more comfortable getting into an area that is specifically defined for a green belt access as opposed to one that tends to meander relatively close to somebody's house and through a manicured lawn area. Uh, so toward that end, we think we would win by moving it over here, keeping it separate from the roadway, uh, and actually keeping it very well defined regarding these fence sections and the plantings and the trail main maintenance itself. And this section is right across the street from the, uh, those of you who probably know the area, I forget the name of it, but it's the the Dairy Suite, the Dairy Dream area, or whatever. Um, it's in that area uh, across from the, uh, the church, which is over in this section, that uh, for anybody who would be driving to a location in order to get out, as opposed to those who would live around this area, get out of their cars to take advantage of the Great Pond Trail, of which this is the trailhead, uh, I think it's a lot more easily accessible this way, particularly when the signage and the entrance can lead people in this way. The other, uh, some of the other uh, points that I'd like to make is Generally speaking, from a private property standpoint, obviously we want to be able to keep uh, acquisitions through the land trust. We want to be able to have undeveloped land to a certain degree. And we certainly would like to be able to have continuation of greenbelt access. However, there are certain points at which we also have to take in consideration landowners' rights. Now, this trail exists and has existed for quite a long time in this location. As you can see up here, however, the dark lines and those on your plans, uh, these are the boundary lines for this lot. It literally bifurcates this property straight, in, straight down to the hourglass section of it. It renders this property certainly not valueless or worthless, but it certainly cuts down on the value of it substantially. Our contention is certainly not to get rid of it. We want to keep it there. And much to his credit, uh, Mr. Kennedy has acquiesced to saying, not only will we just move it, but I'm going to improve this trail so that it is substantially better than it is right now. What we would like to do then is again relocate it to the boundary properties. I'll be very honest and say I don't know where the, uh, the majority of the Greenbelt trails are relative to the specific property boundaries. However, it would seem to me fairly prudent in a situation like this where the overall acreage that you're looking at is about uh, 15 acres and uh, this particular lot is three acres. It's not hundreds or dozens. Uh, is to be able to take this path and very aesthetically pleasingly put it into an area where it is in the best interest of the people who are going to be using it and in the best interest of the people who are going to be living on these lots, which is to say on the boundary line. We're very close to it. Within this easement as well, <coughs> um, the, our clients have uh, granted uh, the Sprague Corporation, which owns all of this property in the back, 
I don't want everything back here going all the way back to Great Pond, uh, an easement to be able to access their property. Sprague used to have, uh, this, and this is the only access as far as I know to the Sprague, to this portion of the Sprague property uh, in this particular section of town. They used to have an easement that coincided with the town's easement. And in fact, they had it before the town acquired the easement. They have since extinguished their rights to that easement. They relocated it over here uh, under the previous owner of the property. Uh, the actual pathway that they used to be able to get back to this, which isn't used often as I understand it, but is indeed used, is not actually located in this easement. That's not a big issue. Uh, what we would like to do, however, and what Sprague has uh, willingly acquiesced to, very much so in fact, is to be able to have the right to be able to use the entirety of Golden Ridge Lane and be able to come out in this section to be able to access their property at whatever point in time they deem it necessary to do so. So again, we're looking at a win-win situation for the property owners of this area, as well as the people who typically want to use this uh, uh, trail itself. Uh, there are some other issues as far as the uh, efficacy of the trail regarding the, uh, the lot which it crosses, and uh, I will uh, leave that to uh, David Chamberlain a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, but suffice it to say that we have contacted, and you will have read into the record here momentarily uh, or during the public hearing, we have contacted uh, all the abutters that you see on this plan, the immediate abutters, which means the Hagmans, Powells, Chapmans, uh, Kennedys, Youngs, and again Powell, regarding their view uh, <coughs> of this uh, potential relocation based on what they would like to see as the immediate property owners in the area. And you'll have that information available to you here shortly. That is, uh, in essence, the, the background of what we're looking at here. And again, to very quickly recap, what we would propose at this point is to literally locate or relocate this easement, same width, over to this point, improve this trail markedly so that it's quite aesthetically pleasing with plantings and fence sections, et cetera. Coming up to this point, crossing as you see it, melt, the yellow melted into the green, and then crossing right next to the boundary of the uh, Young and Powell properties. Now, there was a contention of the site walk, although the weather was less than uh, ideal. Uh, that this tends to be a little bit wetter area. Uh, as a uh, wetlands delineator, I would say that, that the, the drainage swale that uh, you can't really see on this plan, but it does coincide with uh, the vast majority of it, uh, about uh, 150 feet of it actually coincides with the boundary line itself. This is an artificially created drainage swale by the previous owner of this house and this property about 20 years ago. Um, that notwithstanding, the width of that, uh, we all saw it when we were out there. It's about four feet wide. Um, it's about two to two and a half, maybe three feet deep at its deepest. Runs almost along the boundary line and then does curve slightly over in this section as it comes back to a, uh, an artificially created detention pond that's back in this section on the, on the Sprague property. Our contention here is that this property, and you can see based on the uh, levels of contour, which are two-foot contours, uh, is pretty level. There's not a great degree of slope here by any means. So the, the wetlands area, there are actually no wetlands area. Again, the, the channel of the, uh, the drainage swale, which itself does not constitute a wetland, um, is not particularly wet. Is it lower than this section? Yes, by about a foot, maybe two feet. Uh, but that's it. And again, given the, the spatial relationship of this 18-foot proposal relative to this 18-foot proposal and a 14-foot difference between them, we really don't believe that there is any substantial need to relocate it in what you see as the blue line relative to the green line because of a moist or a wetland issue. I don't believe that that exists. Again, um, and we are not, uh, our intention is certainly not to uh, um, make light of the Conservation Commission's effort to try to keep a trail as a trail in a Greenland area or in a more green area. We have to support that. But as we saw when we were out there, this is also a woods area throughout this entire section. And we believe that this will be equally as good as this, and it promotes the goodwill of the people throughout the area. That, in essence, is uh, the presentation as far as the green belt is concerned. What I would like to do, if there are any comments at the moment, I'd be happy to address those or questions. Yes, ma'am. I do have a comment, and that is that I thought, <clears throat> for one thing, that the Conservation Commission and the town um, engineer was rather explicit about not crossing the turnaround. And it seems that you've gone back to your original proposal of crossing the turnaround when 
Excuse me. It was very clear, to me anyway, that that was not the most desirable way to go. Excuse me, Barbara. I think we have to uh, make a determination of completeness before we get into I'm the sorry. substantive discussion. Not to Thank cut you, you off. We'll get there in a moment. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, toward that end, then, I can go on with the presentation for the other, one other issue that's, uh, that I wanted to bring up, or we can do the completeness issue if you wish. Can you briefly complete what you had intended, and then we can move right on? Yes. Thank you. Briefly. There is, <clears throat> excuse me, there is an issue regarding the uh, open space requirement what, on any subject, anything that comes before the board. What we would suggest, and this, uh, and Maureen, please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, we're looking at, based on the number of lots here, we're looking at approximately 37,000 square feet of a requirement for area to be set aside as open space or conservation area. Uh, within this entire subdivision, everything that you see here. What uh, we would propose, and, and just to give you a spatial image of what that looks like or how much that entails, if you take a, a strip that's approximately 75 feet wide, which when you look on your plans is approximately the, uh, the distance from this southerly boundary line to the edge of this wetland line, just beyond it slightly, and then keep that as a uniform distance all the way down to this line right here, which corresponds to this line right here. You've got a strip that uh, equals the amount of square footage that would be required to conserve in this section right in here. That's the amount that we're looking at. What we would propose toward that end, or there's another option, and that is uh, financial, uh, giving no specific property, but uh, making a, a financial <coughs> contribution to uh, ostensibly the purchaser or of other easements or other lands. What we would propose is twofold. In conjunction with moving the easement and substantially improving it, uh, both aesthetically, obviously, as the end result, but a great deal of financial uh, uh, remuneration uh, based on the town to create this, as we've since described, in conjunction with creating a section of property in this particular area that would actually go well beyond, and we'd be very happy, on behalf of our clients, they have indicated that they would be very happy to go well beyond this, uh, the minimum requirement, in this particular section. What this does is set aside a land bank, as it were, for the preservation of property that heretofore or, or uh, henceforth could never be developed. Uh, not an issue, as far as we're concerned. You can see from a little bit more clearly on on this page, that uh, this is the lot that uh, Jeff and Vicki Kennedy wish to retain and on which they placed or planned to put their house. Given the size of this property, approximately eight and a half acres, the other nine or the other acre is the road itself, which is privately owned by them. Uh, and given the wetlands, RP2 wetlands, which generally speaking nobody's going to fool with, or if anybody did, not only because it's a wetland situation, but also because this would be a part of a planned subdivision or approved subdivision anybody would have to come back to the board regardless. But what they would like to do is reserve the right, given this property, to be able to carve it up once, which is about all they have as far as the upland area for net residential density. Uh, that's not a given, but it's an option. And that's what they'd like to as far as an investment is concerned, et cetera. Toward that end, uh, one of the suggestions as far as do uh, donating property, as it were, or, or allowing property to be conserved through a process such as this one, is to be able to grant some upland access, ostensibly for a trail or what have you. The trail may never be built, or it might be. Uh, because of the wetlands in this particular section, and what we're looking at as far as the uh, continuation of the easement over here that allows the public to come down Golden Ridge Lane, that would necessitate doing the same thing here, which means creating an upland trail skirting the wetlands back to this section, all the way back to here, that literally bisects the line. Now, this is not usable property, but obviously it has to be owned by someone. But what we do have is then the potential issue of somebody walking through somebody else's front yard or backyard, in the case may be, which is essentially what we're looking at with this section right here. If there were a specific connection over here, it, it may be a, a slightly different story because we could literally come over this section and not really have to worry about it. But what we're looking at is a pathway that already comes down Golden Ridge Lane in this particular section, however we resolve this issue with the board's comments this evening, and connect to the, uh, uh, the Great Pond Trail that does come back this way. We've already got a trail back here. So what we would like to, uh, to say is relative to the finances that are going to be putting into vastly improving this trail, 
and giving any of this property back in here for a conservation easement to be set aside for open space. That is the issue before us that we would like to say this is our proposal and we'd be happy to do that you know, well in excess of the minimum requirement and it would be right in this section right here to prevent literally somebody doing through this lot and walking near you know, somebody's backyard as it were in a situation that's not too far off of the proposed house. Uh, and then obviously keeping the trails and the open space further away from uh, that kind of development. Thank you. First item for us to consider is completeness. This application was reviewed last month and deemed not complete. We've since had some additional materials submitted, including this evening a memo from the town manager concurring with the financial capability of the applicant. Are there any questions from the board or comments regarding completeness? Chairman, I have a motion for the board to consider if there's no discussion on the issue of completeness. Please go ahead. Uh, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted, the application of K and K Realty for minor subdivision review of Golden Ridge Lane, a three lot subdivision located off Bowery Beach Road, be deemed complete. I'll second. Motion's been made and seconded for completeness. Any further discussion? All in favor? application is deemed complete. Next item on our agenda this evening is to hold a public hearing on this application. So we'll now open the public hearing. If anyone would like to make comments on the record regarding the Golden Ridge subdivision, please come forward to the podium, state your name, and make your comments. I have a letter here which uh, the town planner suggested be read into the record. Sure. Could you give us your name and address, please? Sure. My name is Greg Powell, and I live on uh, 2 Golden Ridge Lane, which is um, this uh, lot right here. Um, let's say um, this letter is addressed to both the planning board and also members of the town council, since uh, the issue it addresses, which is the relocation of the easement really falls, and I understand it, within the jurisdiction of both the planning board and the town council. So we are submitting this letter to you folks this evening for your consideration. Um, the letter is signed by the Hagmans, who uh, live on this side of the uh, easement as it currently exists. It is signed by my wife and I as residents of this lot here. It is signed by Dick and Jenny Chapman, who live on the other side of Golden Ridge Lane, which is the place where uh, the, the road where the uh, easement would be relocated to. And it is signed by Steve and Leslie Young, who live back here, and it is also signed by Mr. Kennedy, the applicant in this case. Um, it says, as residents of Cape Elizabeth and neighbors of the Great Pond Access Right-of-Way, presently located off Route 77, starting at the driveway of Eric and Cheryl Hagman. We support the relocation of the right-of-way to Golden Ridge Lane as shown on the attached drawing. And with our letter we are submitting to you tonight, we have a drawing uh, attached to it. We support the relocation of the right-of-way for the following reasons. Number one, Relocation of the right-of-way will more clearly mark the head or the start of the Greenbelt Trail to Great Pond for members of the public. Number two, Golden Ridge Lane is an established, clearly marked road which will benefit users of the right-of-way by identifying the boundaries of the trail. Number three, the new trail will access Great Pond and its trail system just as the existing trail does. Number four, use of the current right-of-way is awkward and compromised because it overlaps a private driveway and then runs through the backyards of two private residences. Moving the right-of-way to Golden Ridge Lane will avoid this compromise 
improve privacy privacy for the residences and make use of the trail more comfortable for all. Number five, moving the trail will reduce trespassing on private property. Number six, a legal issue exists as to the validity and scope of the present easement, or excuse me, the town's present right of way across <coughs> the property of the Hagmans and Lot A. Relocation of the right of way would settle this issue and clearly establish a right of way once and for all in favor of the town. Finally, the relocation would be done at no cost to the town. For the above reasons, we urge the planning board and the town council to approve the relocation of the right of way from its current location to Golden Ridge Lane as shown on the attached drawing. Thank you for your consideration. So that's our letter. I, uh, I, get, I don't know what the procedure is here. I guess I get to hand it to the chairman. And um, the only other thing that I wanted to say is that um, uh, Mr. Kennedy, working with his professional and with the Sprague's, the Powell's, the Hagman's, has uh, worked pretty hard to put together a workable solution to essentially a bisection or uh, split in two of lot A and to propose a win-win solution to opening up and making more clear to all members of the public the right-of-way uh, to run down Golden Ridge Lane if this board and the town approves it. It was not necessarily an easy job because he had to deal with the Powells, he had to deal with uh, the Sprague's, and uh, all of those folks got together to come up with what we thought was a simple, clear, easy to understand plan, which is that the trail would run down Golden Ridge Lane and that it would take a left turn and it would be on the property lines. And the concept of keeping it on the property lines was one of simplicity and uh, clarity for people who use it, for the landowners who live there, and to preserve and protect the privacy of both the users of the trail as well as the people who live in the neighborhood. So we hope that you will give due consideration to our proposal. And if there are any questions about the letter uh, or any of the points in the letter, I'd be happy to address them since uh, myself and my, uh, my neighbors were essentially the source of the arguments and the points that we made in the letter. Mr. Powell, there are a couple of different routes being talked about this evening. Thank you, sir. For the easement where it would cut across to the Sprague property, Yes. The drawing that comes with your memo, can you happen, can you point out to us there which of those routes you're proposing or advocating? Well, we not only propose it, but after working uh, diligently to, to try to comply with the town planner's recommendation that actually deeds have to be in place before, before we could be complete, okay? We went around in circles with lawyers for over a month and a half, and so actually what you have in your record before you are the deeds that these folks, mm -hmm. you know, basically came up with. And what those deeds say is we go down Golden Ridge Lane. The deeds actually say, we're not talking about 18 feet. I mean, we'll give you 50 feet, okay? Anybody who, in, in Cape Elizabeth who wants to rock down Golden Ridge Lane, any place on either side of the road is welcome to do so. And that's what the deed says. And then when you get down to the end of the road, you take a sharp left turn and you have 18 feet, just as you did in the, under the old deal, right along the property line for clarity sake. And that's what's in the record before you. That's what we all worked out together. We thought that was pretty simple and common sense. So it's the green route up there? Yep, the green route. Right. Thank so. you. Did you have any other comments, sir? Uh, yes, I guess he did. I had one more thing, but I'd be happy to take your questions. You want to go first? Uh, no, go ahead, sir. Okay. Uh, obviously, you were involved. I think you spoke during the uh, site walk that you actually worked the deed out. Is it your opinion that it, in the long run uh, it would make more sense to have a right of way or a deeded piece, piece of property on a lot line rather than somewhere else uh, to make clarity in future changes that might take place? Is that you say that that would make sense? Yeah, I, I, I think that 
the clarity and the simplicity of simply saying we're going to follow the lot line is important. And it was also important, obviously, that people have the right to have a good a good access also. So I uh, I hope it's you know it, it's clear that you know within this 18 feet wide, especially this section, that there'll be plenty of room for people to get on down through there and connect up with the spray trails in it. One of the things that Mr. Kennedy had to do was to get a, uh, a special deed from the Sprague Company to make sure that from a legal standpoint, this easement, unlike this one, was absolutely clear, which means that there wouldn't be any doubt that the town and people you know, who wanted to use the trail could come on right down through here and take a left turn, and then they would have another little easement from the spray company to connect with the old paths. So um, that, that's been done, and that's been agreed to by the Sprague's, and uh, my wife has signed the deed to do this, and that's, that's all in escrow. And so um, we hope you folks see this as the win-win that we do. And um, uh, in that regard, I mean, you know, we've been... Uh, we have lots of neighbors and friends who come on down through to use the Great Pond, but it's obvious to me when they come down that as friendly and as nice as they are, they may not want to see me sitting in my hot tub, okay? And so uh, we're hoping that this is going to make people a little bit more comfortable to use the trail than they have in the past. And I guess my final point that I wanted to bring to everybody's attention is that the, um, the, 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 the basis upon which the town currently uses that road uh, as said in the letter, is legally questionable. And I think um, uh, you have to know the Hagmans, like I do, to know they're pretty nice people, and they're not going to be out raising heck about uh, who's using the, 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 the easement. But the reality is that there is, in, in my judgment, a serious legal issue as to whether there is even a right to, for the town to walk down through there. And um, again, what we're doing by doing this is clarifying that once and for all. The basis of that is that the town's sole origin of any right to go down this trail comes from the spray company. And when the spray company gave that right, they expressly acknowledged in their deed that they knew that there was a problem. And um, it's in the language of the deed itself. And the reason they knew it was a problem is because they didn't have ownership of the underlying land. They gave an easement to the town, holding only an easement that they themselves had to go down that 18 feet. So if the Hagmans weren't such nice people, okay, I mean, it might not be the same situation that we have today. So I'm saying there's a good legal issue which needs to get resolved and put behind us here, too. And you folks as planning board members have the opportunity to sort of, you know, let's do some planning here and get this thing straightened out once and for all. And again, as I say, Mr. Kennedy, uh, the Hagmans, the Powells, uh, the Youngs, the, the Sprague Company have all come together here on a solution to this, and we're hoping you'll, you'll give it your, your, uh, your best consideration. So I just have a, a few quick questions for you. I just want to make sure I understand the ownership of the lot that is basically, it's been described as an hourglass. Is that in you and your wife presently? It's uh, owned by my wife. Okay. And so if the existing Greenbelt Trail is relocated, then there won't be a Greenbelt Trail anymore that's bisecting that property into two. Is that right? That's correct. So then basically that makes that piece of property a lot more attractive for building. Is that right? Absolutely. Okay. I recall during the site walk, um, I think you were asked the question, uh, would it make much of a difference from a building standpoint if the, uh, the section of the Greenbelt Trail was moved to where it is in that map in dark green to where it is in light blue. And I thought your response was you didn't th think that would be such a big difference from your perspective. I, if, if, if I did, I didn't intend to say that. Um, and I, uh, the reason would be, it, it, it's not that it's a big deal, but if you've lived through you know, two months of wrangling with the lawyers to get the aid language right, you don't want to go through this again, number one. And I know that's not a concern of you folks, but it does cost money to people to try to get it right, and we, we work really hard with the spray company to do this. The sir, sir, is, sir, just very quickly, isn't the both the green and the blue part of that trail within this 50-foot uh, easement that's been granted to the, to the spray corporation? That's correct. That's correct. And the reason, however, that 
it is more desirable to have it on the boundary line, aside from the simplicity of knowing where it is, okay, is that the building envelope itself for this property uh, is obviously closer to the far line than it is to the young property line. So avoiding the situation where you have a green belt walking way closer to a home that is built is better than having it farther away. But the, but the setbacks are measured from the easement boundary line anyway. What, pardon me? Right, no, property boundary lines. Okay. I didn't follow the question, but... Uh, Maureen answered it, thank okay. you. <laughs> All right, I think we should let other folks have an opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Powell. Anyone else like to make a comment? <laughs> you can come up with you if you like. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll leave my helpers in the back of the room. Thank you. Um, my name is Mike Duddy. I live at 11 Crescent View Avenue. I currently serve as the uh, chairperson for the Conservation Commission. Um, we've been wrestling with the issues um, being discussed tonight for most of the year. Um, early on, I thought, frankly, that um, all of these issues relate to rest uh, at the beginning of the year, working with Mr. Jim Fisher. I was some, somewhat surprised to see them come up um, later this year as still unresolved. Um, let me make a couple of brief comments and then maybe perhaps a little bit of history. Um, I've been serving on the Conservation Commission for almost five years very familiar with the work of my predecessors on the commission, who I'm talking with um, people who are very active personally in reviewing the documents and the histories and so on and so forth. Um, I think it's accurate to say that certainly in the length of time that I've been involved with the commission, uh, personally building trails, siting trails, locating trails, that placing a trail along a property line has never been and is not now a factor that's important from the Conservation Commission's point of view. From the Conservation Commission's point of view, on behalf of the town, in terms of making optimum use of open space, we cite trails based on a variety of factors dealing with um, what will give the uh, residents of the town the best experience as they walk through the trail, what um, location of the trail best avoids sensitive wildlife areas, um, where the location will best keep the trail in a high and dry area, um, where the trail will help, in fact, um, keep the trail off boundary lines <clears throat> so that not additional property owners, but only one property owner may be impacted. <clears throat> From the Commission's point of view, the idea that locating a trail on a property line um, enhances the simplicity doesn't resonate. It doesn't mean anything to us from the town's point of view. It's just as simple from the Conservation Commission's point of view to locate a trail where it's optimum on the face of the earth, which frequently and almost always it's not on the boundary line. I've built trails, located them, we put it where it makes sense on the face of the earth. I say that because I've heard several representations about the green line being more simple um, from the Conservation Commission's point of view, it's not more simple, it's not less simple, it's not more simple than the blue line, so to speak. As far as I understand the situation as it stands tonight, the only reason that um, has been really offered that, that, and I think gets to the heart of this matter about why the applicant and the uh, parties in interest prefer location along the boundary line, is that that's, where the, that's how the deeds in escrow have been drafted and they prefer not to go through the headache of changing it. Um, I actually truly apologize and regret that that has wound up as the case. From almost a year ago, from the Conservation Commission's point of view, we have been trying to get this right. We've spent a lot of time on it. We've met with the um, applicant's representative. We've walked the trail. From the outset, from the earliest point of time that we've talked with the applicant on, we have been stressing that from the Conservation Commission's point of view, this green proposed trail was, was not um, an option for us. We did not believe it was in the best interests of the town to run the trail in that location. After our initial site walk <clears throat> with Mr. Fisher, um, where we worked out all of the details of this section of the trail, 
I thought, <clears throat> from the Commission's point of view, that they had heard very clearly and actually were in agreement that the trail was not going to be located over here. There was a long period, several months of silence before it became clear when they came back to the planning board that they were still working here. In that interim, it's unfortunate, deeds were drafted. Um, the, the neighbor, Mr. Pop, I've never heard from him at the Con Conservation Commission. I've never heard from the applicant's representative or anybody else that they were drafting deeds and doing surveys for a trail location which the Conservation Commission had gone out of its way to say it did not support. And so it's a little frustrating from the Conservation Commission's point of view to be here tonight and now have deeds and escrow driving the decision of where on the face of the earth the trail is going to be. Had they come and said to us early on, look, we get the fact that you actually wanted the trail over here, we're really still having problems with that talk to us, work with us, because we're about to get deeds drafted, we would have been happy to do that and we could have avoided the tail wagging the dog here tonight, but I think that's where we've unfortunately ended up. Now, as a practical matter, life is a compromise. Um, it is true that from the Conservation Commission's point of view, the current trailhead for um, the easement as it exists now is not optimal. It travels down a driveway before, uh, for about 30 feet before makes a right-hand turn um, to a rather pleasant walk down here to the, uh, to the woods. <clears throat> but in point of fact, um, the rest of the trail is very nice because it's not located alongside somebody's driveway or road. Now, historically speaking, the purpose of the town's Greenbelt Trail arose from a desire to connect the Crescent Beach area, um, roughly down here, to Fort Williams not along the existing roadways and driveways, but through open space, natural areas, woods, and fields. Um, it's a compromise from the Conservation Commission's point of view to move a trail that is not running along a driveway um, and is not going to be intersected by driveways to bring it over to where a driveway is. But life's a compromise. We've tried to be flexible and responsive to the property owners who, frankly, you know, have never been all that enamored with the trail where it is. But understand, it, it can be a win-win solution, but, you know, we're already trading a number of factors from the town's perspective and saying, yeah, we can get on board with the idea of moving the trail. You know, it, tra it, it will be a nice trail, but it's not going to be a natural trail once it's, co once it's relocated, if it is, to um, Golden Ridge Lane. It's simply going to be a walkway alongside a dirt road. That's very different from the asset the town currently has. But it's a compromise. I, I say that to, um, to emphasize, look, it's a compromise to come over here. I think it's important to be flexible to private landowners. We thought it would make most sense from the town's point of view to follow the current trail <clears throat> or the current road, which is where the, the spray easement is now. The landowner was very much resistant to that. We said, fine, ultimately. We understand the argument that had some force of logic that you did not want to bisect for building purposes this, this lot B or lot A, whatever it's called. And so we finally said, look, we prefer it over here, but we're still willing to compromise. We still are not enamored with this boundary line proposal, and we certainly are not enamored with crossing the, the, the turnaround area here. But we understand that they don't want to have multiple easements burdening this lot um, so we've said, look, we'll compromise again. We'll collate, co-locate it over what's already going to be an easement. There can be no argument that is somehow more burdensome. We're going to put it right over, or where we can get behind and recommend putting it right over the 50-foot spray easement. It should be just as simple. If they have a deed description for this spray easement already in escrow, all we're going to do then, if Boundary lines are what we're talking about, is follow the boundary line of that spray easement. Simple. They've got the measurements on the face of the earth, strike off a distance 18 feet from it, and that's where the trail will go. From the town's perspective, we have an asset. It's a, it is a phenomenally important asset, this trail link. We wanted to get it right from the start. We've been very interested in being flexible in responsive to private landowners' desires and abutting neighbors and so on and so forth. 
Um, we have picked up an opportunity, we think, to improve the trailhead from here to here, but the whole idea is a compromise. We've compromised further to put the trail where um, the proposed blue is running behind, uh, directly behind the turnout. In terms of the people who are building the trails, we have a high and dry trail here. Our concern is with the trail <clears throat> in this area here, we're going to have a wet area. It doesn't seem significant if you're not the person who's carrying in the two by eights, 12 feet long, but from the point of view of the people who carry in the material and have to go in year in and year, year out to maintain it, it is significant. Now, just before coming here, the, uh, the applicant said, well, you know, is there still some room for compromise on that point? We continue to want to be as flexible as we can in terms of trying to strike a balance between the interests of the town, the interests of the applicant, interests of landowners there may possibly be some additional room for compromise on the point. I can't speak for the, um, the com commission as a whole on that. We did sit down, we re-examined um, as a commission together whether we wanted to go with the green proposal or stick with the blue. It was a unanimous vote at the time that it made sense from the town's perspective, using all the traditional variables that the Conservation Commission uses to stick with this blue proposal. Um, if there's going to be some further compromise, we'll have to take it back and re-examine it from there. But our position continues to be the town has an asset. We don't want to mess it up. We want to do it right. Doing it right currently involves the yellow trail and the blue trail is um, drawn. Beyond that, I'll be very happy to answer questions from the planning board. Um, one of the things that Mr. Powell said was, in his mind, there was some question as to the legality of the easement that exists. That's, that's a new issue to me. I didn't hear that at the site walk. I haven't heard that before today. It, what, what is the Conservation Commission's take on that? I mean, It's a new issue for us. I mean, I've <clears throat> been using it for many, many years. We've heard you know, various things about people not liking it. I've never heard that there's a legal issue with it. If there's a legal issue with it, we should step back and examine it. Yeah, I simply can't speak to it. Okay, and that's... It's, it's not been something historically dealt with, um, at least during the five <coughs> years I've been served. Okay. Maureen, would you care to comment on that? If, if that is an issue that the board is going to take into consideration tonight, uh, my suggestion would be to uh, give staff time to take it to the town attorney and look at it. Uh, you know, I've looked at the easement. It's not from the Sprague Corporation. It's from Douglas, Tick, Douglas Tinsman and uh, Doug Pickering, uh, Dave Pickering, excuse me, who were the original subdividers of the property. And they are the ones that conveyed the easement to the town for the pedestrian easement. Maybe there is some illegality, but nothing that I've ever heard of un until this evening. That's, that was my question. You've never heard any question as to that as an issue and, until and now. The, and my understanding is that the, the Hagmans were given a driveway permit by the town over our existing easement. So the easement predated the driveway. But again, if this is an issue the board needs an answer on, um, you know, you can end the discussion tonight and I can take it back and we can look at it and bring the town attorney into it. Uh, what, what I don't want to do is ultimately deny a uh, request to relocate the easement and then have the, the property owners who are affected by the existing easement bring a lawsuit uh, that, end, that makes the end result that there's no access uh, to, the, to the Great Pond I mean, trail system. Um, I mean, it seems to me, with all due respect to Mr. Powell, we, we, I don't think he's making threats, but there is that issue in the, in the back of this discussion that possibly we could end up with nothing if we don't acquiesce to their request that the easement be located on the, the green section of that map. So I would like to have some more guidance on that issue. Barbara? I may be remembering incorrectly, but didn't the town engineer also say that he didn't want an easement going across a turnaround? Uh, his, his concern, he, he actually echoes the concerns of the Conservation Commission that that is a wet area, that it is a drainage swale. Um, and that the, the green strip is wetter than the blue strip. So, you know, the, the, we're having different people come to the same conclusion that you don't put a, a, a walk. Where we have walking trails and drainage swales, we're relocating them because 
they're, they are, they're just too wet. Well, it seems to me <clears throat> if we're talking about a compromise, we're compromised by compromising, and as the Conservation Commission is, by saying we'll consider moving the easement to alongside Golden Ridge Lane, but that we are asking that the easement cut across in a straight line on the, I believe it's the southerly side of the turnaround and just go straight into the spray land. It seems to me that's a fairly reasonable, it's reasonable, it's a fair compromise. We're giving and we're asking you to give a little bit too. Do we have any other questions for Mr. Duddy? I think we should complete the hearing before we get into too much substantive discussion because there are probably okay. other people who may sure. want to speak. Thank you. Anyone else like to make a comment? Come on up. Hello. Uh, my name is Jonah Rosenfield. I live at 243 Spurwing Avenue. I'm also on the Conservation Commission. And I've served on the Conservation Commission since January of this year. And I just wanted to reiterate what Mike Duddy had to say, which is that in the year that I've been on the Conservation Commission, <laughs> the topics that we've looked at have been topics that we've looked at from a town standpoint, sort of what's the best use of whether it be the open space, the Greenbelt Trail, or access for the whole town to use. And when the applicant came to us at the beginning of the year, right when I started, uh, the discussion was around moving this easement and looking for our recommendation uh, because we thought it would be an improvement to it. And sort of what we had come to, come to realize at the beginning of the year is what we thought would be sort of the win-win situation that Mr. Mr. Fisher was talking about. So if that's not, um, in my opinion, and I believe in the Conservation Commission's um, opinion, what's represented by the green, by the green easement, by the placement of the green easement on the north side of the Sprague, uh, Sprague easement, we uh, we would never want to trade down the, the town's assets, uh, especially when looking at uh, sort of the Greenbelt Trail, which is a, an integral part of the town and the beauty of the town and the recreation of the town. So what we were looking for in terms of uh, sort of the idea of moving this easement was something that would either keep the easement um, as good as it currently is or make it better. And that's what we believe this blue line to be, sort of the win-win for the town uh, and for the applicant who came, with, came to us for these, uh, for these recommendations. I can't speak to the legal issues or um, really the, the beliefs or opinions of the property owners but just from what we talked about in the Conservation Commission and sort of looking at the town assets as a whole and sort of what's best for the town of <coughs> Elizabeth, um, the Conservation Commission believes, and I believe, that the blue easement is sort of the win-win solution to this. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jeff Kelly. I'm that good. Um, I kind of disagree with that because I think the win for the town is to move it and build the new access because now people use my road, they come down it anyways, and then they go across Spray's easement right here, which is private property, is what they're using now. So I feel that's our compromise, move it over to where people will use it, and then we're looking for our compromise to switch from here. Thank you. Would anyone else like to make a comment? My name is Mike Pulsar, I live at 30 Broad Cove Road. I'm going to come at it from a little bit of, of an angle. I'm a, a Conservation Commission member. But I, I want you to know that the day that uh, I first did the, the first site walk, I felt very uncomfortable walking along that uh, property line. I felt like I was in someone's yard. Actually, the lady that lived there came out, kind of inquired what you guys were doing. I felt like I was in their yard, and she wasn't even aware that we were doing a site walk that day. And we'd been told that uh, all the property owners around there knew about the proposal. So just from a, a citizen's point of view, I feel that as, if I can get as far away from someone's yard, the better off I am. I feel uncomfortable walking now on this, uh, the old, uh, well, the current uh, line right now. Because I feel like I'm in someone's driveway, and then I walk in someone's backyard, I understand his concern. But I would feel the same way walking along this property owner's line. Just a thought. Thank you. Anyone else care to speak? If not, we'll 
close the public hearing. Mr. Fisher, I have this notion that you have something to say. <laughs> I'm just kind of hanging around the podium to answer questions. If you would, please uh, make a brief comment before we begin discussion. Yes. Um, having listened to everything here this evening, which has been a culmination of effort of what's been happening over the past year or so, it really seems to me that, generally speaking, everybody is pretty much on the same sheet of music. And that the, the real issue at hand, and, and not to beat the dead horse, is this section right up here. On which side of a 50-foot easement do we actually relocate 160 feet of the trail? Everything is workable, uh, in my opinion, as far as the bottom line is concerned. One of the issues that I think Barbara was going to ask, and probably still will, about uh, adhering to the green section as opposed to the blue section, is um, we're crossing a, uh, an emergency turnout area. And then there was somebody else, uh, whether it was the town engineer or someone else who was talking about uh, a wetter area. First things first, the, uh, the actual turnout, and I would have to actually go back to the, uh, the town engineer and see if this is feasible, but it typically is as a, uh, a non-traveled way area. From a green perspective, keeping in mind that this turnout is ostensibly for the only two properties that would actually use it, which are, are the Youngs and the Kennedys coming from private driveways. We could actually make this turnout the required MDOT subgrade materials that the fire chief would want or typically asks for in conjunction with the building of any road and then cover it with loam. It's a fairly standard procedure, not two feet of loam, but four or five inches of loam that would allow it to be planted as opposed to seeing a gravel turnout there. It still functions the same as an emergency turnout area for emergency vehicles, fire trucks, ambulances, what have you, to the extent it would be necessary. But it's not going to become too particularly obvious to anybody. Well, first of all, it's a private road, so there shouldn't be you know, Joe Smith and the like driving down here all the time to be able to get to the trail. The point being is that we can make this aesthetically pleasing. Granted, we're not going to be able to plant trees in the middle of it. However, it doesn't have to look like a road because it's not a road. It's a short turnout. Um, and again, without reiterating everything that's already been said, the biggest contention that we were looking at is on which side of this middle 14-foot strip, that which you see in, in, in white here, on which side do we actually put the path? And the path, again, is going to go basically, I mean, we can create it, but it's going to go wherever it goes to a certain degree as people use it. 14 feet isn't that great. Now, add to that the 4-foot wide, 5-foot actual trail, and you're looking at closer to 20 feet. Is it substantially different from 20 feet on this side to 20 feet on this side? Our contention is no. Is it that big of a deal? All of the things considered, our contention would be no. However, there is the clarity, the property owner's rights, and the contention of the immediate property owners in this section that if we're looking at 14 feet, is it that big of a deal to just be able to segue it over into this section as opposed to right here? And one of Mike's comments, one of uh, Mr. Duddy's comments earlier about the maintenance of the trail, the uh, creation and maintenance of the trail, I know exactly what he's talking about. I've, I've had a hand in building some of these trails. Um, but the applicant is going to build the trail. That's a given. Uh, if other members of the Conservation Commission want to come in and lend the hand or lend some expertise as far as supervision is concerned, that's wonderful. But financially and physically, it's the applicant who's building it. Now, obviously, it has to be maintained over the course of a few years, 20 years, whatever it may be. Uh, but how much maintenance, other than the cutting or clearing away a couple of some dead trees that may fall on their limbs or whatever, how much maintenance really is there of a trail like that? I'll answer that in one respect, and that is there is a, this uh, small drainage swale that does come up. It's going to cross over both sections. As it crosses underneath the trail, right? actually not underneath, over the top of the trail right now, that may constitute a necessity for some planking or maybe even a little bridge. Not an issue. We'll take care of that. So again, our contention to make everybody feel pretty comfortable, given a 14-foot strip, we would just like to be able to see the trail up in this section right here. There's always room for compromise. That's our proposal. Ian. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Please do. Um, just to summarize, can you give me your, um, your opposition to the Conservation Commission's green trail in, in a one, two, three format. What, what is the applicant's problem with, or why do they oppose what the Conservation Commission 
is, is proposing. In a nutshell. Lou? Well, they, I mean, I have my colors wrong. The commission is advocating the light blue, which is the more southerly. Like, it looks green to me Bottom. from here, but <laughs> right, exactly. This is the, the, southern, the southern proposal. The, uh, and what what is your opposition to that in a one, two, three format? I'm trying to. I'm just having a hard time getting my arms around why. You know, you've already identified that there's not a significant difference. You know, outlining it, and but I'm I'm just having a hard time understanding. What's wrong with moving it down in the way we're talking about? The answer to your question, and, and a very good question, why is 14 feet really an issue, is if this were a totally wooded area and preserved, I mean, the entire section as such, it wouldn't be an issue. We wouldn't care. However, this, is, this constitutes from this line right here on the northerly side of what you see as the green line through this area a residential building envelope. This is the area that has been tested, actually the entire area was tested, but this is the area that has been found acceptable from a test pit standpoint, from a residential building standpoint, in which to put a house. Now, people, I mean, they're perhaps even members of the board, but certainly people can pump to septic systems. That's not so much of an issue either, except that relative to access of the road, keeping the distance between the dwellings that are out here maximally as in let's try to position ourselves as best as possible for a potential house lot that would be built upon, a house lot that potentially would be built upon with a house right in this section now suddenly that 14 feet becomes a little bit more important to the point of being substantially more important and I would just draw your attention down to the, uh, the current location of the trail right now. You can see a portion of the Hagman's dwelling and the Powell's dwelling. This section, which is identified as 14 feet up here, it's a, it's a little bit more than that right down here. And look at how close it is to the house. So toward this end, now there is a bigger on a building envelope here, but more than likely, it is very conceivable that any house that does go in here, and that's not a guarantee that a house is going to, but it is a building lot, is going to be situated right here. If we've got somebody coming down in this section and staying essentially as far away from the Young's dwelling and the potential building that's going to be right down in here relative to the septic test pits, that 14 feet stretches out a little bit. If it's 300 feet back, who cares? But it's not. This is the edge of the building envelope right in here. You're looking at about 25 feet. Pushing that trail 14, further than, 14 feet further than that is fairly substantial given that particular distance. Long answer to a short question. But no, I mean, that's, in essence, that's the base of that argument. Thank you. Uh, is the existing Greenbelt Trail, would it be closer, further away, or the same distance away from the building lot? Uh, I'm not sure I understand. Well, the, you, you talked about that if the new Greenbelt Trail went on the southerly portion of that 50-foot easement, there, there would be a certain distance between Yes. The green belt and then a, a potential new house. What I'm wondering is how far away would a new house be from the existing green belt trail? The, the, the blue line, if we put in the blue line. Oh, the, existing. the existing one. Oh, right there. I mean, literally, what is the distance right here? Right. In other words, if we didn't change anything on the green belt trail and a, a new house went in on lot A in that proposed building envelope, how close would that new house be to the existing green belt trail? <clears throat> I'm sorry, David. I still don't understand what you're mm -hmm. getting at. This distance right here to this trail. Uh, okay. is about you're, you're, you're talking about building a new house in lot A. Yes. Potentially. Yes. If the Greenbelt Trail stays where it is, right. how far away would the new house be to the existing oh, I see. Greenbelt Trail? I understand. Um, that depends entirely on where they situate the house. That because we don't know exactly where that house is going to go, and there may not even be a house there. But if it is sold, and there's a potential for the building envelope over here as well, and then be able to pump up here. But as an answer your question, this uh, the Powell's house right now is sizable but not huge. Take that cutout, as it were, that silhouette, and move it up into either this position or this position, and there's not a whole lot of room behind beyond this house where it would fit right in here anyway. So the answer to your question is probably anywhere from 10 to 15 feet, if it's up in here, to probably, if it's a similar size house, 
positioned as far back as possible. 20 feet, 25 feet maximally. So, so it seems to me that they're going to still have the same problem with respect to the location of the house vis-a-vis -vis a Greenbelt Trail. If, it's, if the Greenbelt Trail stays in the same place or if it's put in the southerly portion. Yes, okay. which is exactly why we want to try to take that. We understand that it's, we don't really look at it as a problem necessarily, but more of a challenge in that in able to be able to grant the Greenbelt Trail to the town, how can we do that with the greatest respect for the people who are going to use it relative to the respect for the person who would ostensibly put a house here? And again, that spatial distance, because we're not talking long, long ways, is fairly important. Mr. Fisher, the, were a house to be built on Lot A, it is entirely possible, though, that the house could be on the left side, the westerly side of the building envelope, in which case the house would be quite a distance away from either the blue or the green route, uh, and in fact, significantly further away than the existing house owned by the Youngs is from the current trail through the Sprague property. So a, a future owner would have that option if they were concerned about proximity to the trail, no matter which route it was on, to locate on the other part of that building lot. From a zoning perspective, yes. Okay. The board has a, a number of issues to consider tonight. We're, we're focusing quite a bit on the Greenbelt Trail. I would direct your attention to the memorandum from both the town planner and the town engineer, though. And this is our opportunity to discuss, as far as we want to, all of the issues surrounding Greenbelt Trail, surrounding um, open space. And I think there were a couple of other items. So I'd invite members of the board to offer comments and, and discussions on any of those. Clarification purposes, I'm, on, I'm uh, off the Greenbelt Trail for a moment. You'd like the, the board to waive the 20-foot uh, width requirement for the roadway and, and reduce that to 18 feet. It would be gravel on the travel way but paved on all the driveways that connect to it. Is that the configuration as proposed? Uh, we don't propose anything in particular as far as the driveways are concerned. That's a private concern. But, the but they're already paved as I understand it. Uh, yes, I believe you're right. Um, what we propose is to keep the integrity of it as much of the country feel as possible of the, uh, the road the way it is. Um, but there is a requirement for the first 50 feet to be paved regardless of the situation. And we don't have an issue with that. Actually, the ordinance was recently amended to 10 feet. 10 feet. Yes, sir. You're welcome to pay 50 if you so choose. <laughs> 10 would be the requirement. <laughs> I'll uh, discuss that with our client, but I would bet you know the answer. So our preference is to keep it gravel. So the variance, the waiver that you're looking for is two feet from 20 to 18 on road travelway width? That's correct. Okay. I'm not saying okay, I agree. I'm just saying okay, I understand. I understand. I can further clarify that, actually. I mean, it doesn't seem like a great difference. But uh, the reason for the 18 feet is in order to be able to accommodate the subsequent 18 feet for the uh, uh, Greenbelt easement, we're dealing with the travelway, drainage swales, and the sloping distance on the other side of that travelway. <coughs> A reverse slope up to where the green building is going to be, and then the trail itself. In order to be able to get that into uniform width of 50 feet, we need to be able to have that travel width section of Jackson Street 18 feet. Keeping in mind that the subgrade materials, the MDOT specifications, and subgrade materials with two feet on either side, which will still be just that. So the overall width of the potential travel way as far as the urgency of the vehicles are concerned um, would be uh, 22 feet. Jim, I, I just, I'm not sure I understood uh, how you were planning to deal with the open space issue again. I, do you have anything on a plan that would indicate what portion of the, the larger lot would be set aside as open space? No, because we, we did that specifically so that uh, we could get comments from the board. And as a condition of approval, what we would suggest again is in, in just giving you the idea of what that would look like in terms of overall square footage relative to this whole property. Um, our proposal would be, in order to be able to have it accessed by the same easement, 
um, is to cut that easement across here, the town would have it anyway, and then create this as um, space right back in here that would, would uh, fulfill the physical square footage requirement for that particular area to be set aside as a conservation easement. So as a condition of approval, we can say we would literally hold that particular area to the minimum square footage that's required. Um, but the, our, our client has also indicated that uh, we can do more than that if you wish, if the town wishes. That's not an issue. More of it in this section in here, uh, which does not affect in a similar situation what we're dealing with over in the green belt, which is why we kept that as a segue to deal with these two issues at the same time. Uh, if I may, I'd like to invite the town planner to comment on on that suggestion for open space to be located at that particular place in the property? Just to give the board some background, I think the, the last several subdivisions you've reviewed have been clustered subdivisions. And when you review a clustered subdivision, there's a requirement for 40% open space set aside. So <coughs> we really haven't spent a lot of time looking at this particular um, standard standard Q under the subdivision standards because whenever someone came in with an open space subdivision they were automatically meeting this because they were setting aside more than the required amount for the standard. This particular subdivision is not a clustered subdivision so there's no automatic set aside um, but the ordinance does require and the subdivision ordinance has required for 25 years that open space be set aside as part of uh, any new development. Um, in 19, I think the 1995, uh, we converted the language of the standard into what we call a fee. And the reason we did that was there were some decisions from the U.S. Supreme Court that said that we needed to reformulate what we were doing in order to pass a legal challenge. So what we've now said is we've said this is how much open space the town owns. And right now we have uh, about 1,100 square, 1,100 um, acres of open 1,100 acres of open space. We've taken that and divided it by the number of people in the town and actually the number of lots and the number of people in the household and we've come up with what we call a community standard per house. And the idea is that right now every household in Cape Elizabeth contributes to this 1,100 acres and when a new lot is created they ought to make the same contribution so that whenever new development occurs in the town the total amount of open space never declines we maintain our current standard. If we want to improve our standard, if we want to preserve more open space per person than we currently have, we have to use other means to do that. So this standard only maintains the current level of open space preservation. Um, we, in 2002, updated the numbers in the standard. The standard was adopted in 95. It existed in another form since the 70s. But the current numbers are that for any new subdivision, uh, you need to either provide 12,545 square feet per lot or $4,320 per lot. And if you provide the fee, it is set aside an account and it only can be used for the purchase or improvement of open space. So it's not just a fee that can be thrown into the general fund. It has to be used to, to promote open space preservation. And I have an impact fee sheet that I can provide you with if you're interested in it. So. We have this requirement. Normally, we don't have to look at it in too much detail because we're working with cluster developments. But I just want to point out that uh, the requirement gives the planning board the authority to determine whether or not there should be a land donation or a fee payment. And it gives the planning board specifically the resulting land dedication would be too small to be useful or inappropriately located. The planning board may require the applicant to pay a fee. I bring that up because I think there, there's a clear understanding in that that the board is supposed to look at the quality of the open space, not just the quantity. With that in mind, I spoke with Mr. Fisher looking at this property and seeing if there was a way that we could find an opportunity for the applicant to meet the standard as painlessly as possible um, and still contribute to the overall town open space plan. Um, there's not a lot of very well located open space in this project. Uh, typically, the, the town will accept wetlands as part of its open space uh, requirement as long as you get a dry edge. And the reason you want the dry edge is you want the public to be able to walk along the side of the wetlands, thereby enjoying the open space which you've now preserved. 
when we looked at the project, what I suggested to Mr. Fisher is that we preserve all the wetlands on the southern corner of the third lot, because it can't be developed anyway, that we create a dry edge along that wetland so that you could walk from the, see, the east side of Golden Ridge Lane along the edge of the wetlands to the far eastern corner of the property and then run up that eastern, northeastern edge and reconnect up with the existing Greenbelt Trail. And that way, there would be a loop created. And we could argue that that would have some value to the town's open space. Uh, what Mr. Fisher is proposing is, in fact, the donation of the required amount of open space as wetland without any real additional advantage. Any questions? Well, that clarifies a lot. I was having a hard time wrapping my arms around how that strip of land was going to be of any use. And just kind of pointing to the diagram on the board, I, I, I didn't appear to me that there was enough for us to go on that that would be uh, satisfactory under the, uh, the, the ordinance. So if we're, in order to explore this issue further, we need something more concrete than, than what you proposed. I don't think that Greenbelt connection is really necessary, but it does at least give us some support that this would be useful open space. You're the applicant. Yeah. You and your representative are welcome to discuss with us throughout the evening. Oh, I just have a, a comment on that. Up until a week ago, the land we were donating for the new path was sufficient for this donation. Uh, it changed last Wednesday, so we really didn't have much time to plan on it. Um, I feel with giving this land here for the green belt plus this wetlands, it's kind of ample for what I need to donate back. Doing this loop is what we're getting away from over here. You're putting a path around my property. I build up here, I'm going to have people walking right behind my house. And I think that's what we're trying to get rid of with the green boat, moving it to the, to the separate. Thank you. We need the alternative then to simply make a cash payment. One of the other issues I'd like to make, if I may, regarding the, uh, the actual land um, area is um, this area, other than the fact that it's literally located in Cape Elizabeth, first of all, it's not too far from the ocean, which is, you know, there's Bowery Beach Road and ocean down there. Um, when you drive down, when we were at the site walk and we took a look at this area, it's got certainly an inherent beauty in that it's you know, natural and anything natural is going to have a certain beauty to it. But other than that, from an aesthetic standpoint, there are no scenic vistas. There are no very interesting or huge outcrops of ledge or rock, something that would entice people to come and sketch it as an artist or whatever. As far as the overall preservation of land is concerned, we absolutely want to do that. At least meet the minimum, which we have to do, or beyond that. And we can do substantially beyond that. The biggest issue that we're, when I say substantially, and this is again where we wanted the comments of the board, because we can do this as a, uh, uh, as a condition of approval and say we could do the entire wetlands or any portion thereof, which is substantially greater than the minimum requirement. That's not an issue. The biggest issue that we do have is, as Mr. Kennedy just mentioned, if we come across with an upland area, as far as this path is concerned, just by virtue of the fact that the wetlands are here, and, and we could limit it down to this section, but let's do all of it. Then again, we're kind of creating the same problem. Yes, it's, it's absolutely nice for members of the public to be able to use the Greenbelt Trail, but it really shouldn't be, I believe, at the expense of the actual property owners who are giving that land to the, green, to the town for the Greenbelt use, or for the preservation of land use. So what we're creating is essentially another issue or at least problem for the property owner in that regarding a house here and the potential for another house here, we're, we're back in the backyards and the side yards again. Without beating the dead horse, there's a lot of financial um, monies that are going to be put to improving a very nice trail over here and the giving, as it were, of this property far in excess of the minimum required to be forever in a day preserved as open space where nobody's going to go there. 
toward that end, given both of those considerations, we think we have more than met the uh, ideas of the regulation. Barbara? I have a question for Maureen. Maureen, does that easement for the trail, does that count as part of the donation? Because by my rough calculations, it would be about 9,000 square feet. I don't see how you can count it as a calculation if it's being used as a trade for another easement that you were giving up, especially an easement that was acquired by the town through exactly this type of review by the planning board. It would seem to me that uh, there's an unresolved issue about the location of the new easement. There's an unresolved issue about the location of open space, regardless of size, uh, versus the payment of an impact fee. And there's a potentially a new issue about the legal status of the current easement, which um, I'm sensing from the rest of the board could have, a, have an impact on any potential ruling. I'd like to hear comments from other members of the board. I'm, uh, I'm getting the sense that we need some more work done on this before we can really make a final determination. Mr. Chairman. Sir. I don't believe the legality of the existing easement has anything at all to do with this application. It doesn't enter into my mind in whether I'm going to vote for or against it. I don't think we've given enough credit to the applicant willing to bear the personal cost of building over 500 feet of new trail, which is definitely going to be an improvement over what we have now. I've walked this trail. I've walked it with the former chair and member of the Conservation Commission. I actually felt uncomfortable walking on the existing trail. I think this trail will be an improvement in regards to whether it's located on a boundary. This is a town of 10,000 people of which one landowner owns over 20 percent of the land. There are two state parks, so there's not a great deal of land left after you subtract that. The fact that some of our easements and trails are going to go by a house or by a property line or alongside a road, that's already true. Also, what ap th this applicant is proposing to do is a definite improvement and, quite frankly, a much better job than the town of Cape Elizabeth itself has done. If you just look at the Gulf Coast properties up behind the town transfer station, most of the land that the town gave to itself, if you will, for public easements is unwalkable three months of the year, and it's quite swampy. Uh, I damn near drowned up there myself one day trying to rescue my Labrador retriever in about three feet of mud. Uh, so it's no secret that my term of office here on the planning board has been a supporter of private property rights. I personally feel the applicant's done a very good job. The questions that can remain can easily be handled by conditions placed on approval. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cotter. Barbara? Um, you know, again, I'm going back. Actually, I think they calculated wrong because it looks like this road is longer than I've calculated. Um, does, do we have the flexibility of saying that there are, uh, as Mr. Cotter has said, improvements on this parcel that we could count it as part of the open space. Do we have that flexibility or don't we? Maureen? I can, in my opinion, you're trading one easement for another. And it's, it's a serious precedent that you're setting. Uh, I understand that there's a lot of improvements, but I mean, what I'm hearing from the Conservation Commission is the improvements and the easement are one package without the improvements, it's not an equivalent trade. <clears throat> I can go to our town attorney and ask him that question and get an answer for you. Okay, well, another question might be, can we have a view easement as opposed to a walking easement and take a larger parcel? I mean, this, the wetland here represents probably three acres just in terms of eyeball, which is a lot more than the number of square feet that were mentioned as an easement. I mean, do we have to be able to walk across every single easement? Or can we just enjoy looking at them because nobody could ever split the lot and develop it? Not that you could develop the wetland. You're saying in lieu of the fee. Pardon? In lieu, lieu of the fee. Given all the other things the applicant's doing. 
Is that well, that, given the fact that the applicant is, is improving this road, sure. we still haven't resolved the question of where it's going I, to I go. understand that. And I think that's perhaps a compromise that the applicant might consider. But to, to, just to answer that question, um, the standard by which uh, we calculated open space only includes property to which there is public access. Can I ask Maureen another? What you mean by that is that when it's open space, any resident of the town has a right to walk on it? Yes. Legally? Okay. Sir? I have a couple other comments and questions. Um, in the letter that we received from the town engineer, um, Item number five, um, easements to uh, the last sentence, easements to allow these encroachments should be received by the applicant. Um, what they mean by that is that those areas where we're extending the drainage that goes under the right of way, I would like to know, I, I haven't seen them, but are they in place at this point? Can we expect those? Absolutely. In fact, Mr. Powell has a letter uh, signed by his wife, who is the defective the owner of the okay. properties, that grants those easements. Okay, good. Um, I, I can't e answer this legal question, but as I see it tonight, what I'm what I'm seeing is that the conveyance of this new right away from the Hammerhead turnaround, uh, there's going to be two easements on there. One is by the Sprague Corporation, and the other one's uh, going to be by the landowner and control or requested it be designed according to the way the Conservation Commission would like it. My question is this, because I'm not an attorney, but with, with the Sprague easement, would that allow citizens to walk across it, or is it for a specific use? Does anybody know that? The way the spray easement is written is that they would be able to, they, the spray corporation, would have access to their property over this particular section. It does not equate, as I understand it, um, to members of the public, although they understand that it does coincide with a public easement. To be perfectly honest, Dave, I think it, it's, it's, it's possible that Sprague won't do anything with it, but more than likely, because this is the only access to their property, I'm not speaking for them. But uh, because this is the only access to their property in this particular area, they probably will improve some type of woods road or something like that to be able to get into the property to the extent that they deem it necessary. Toward that end, again, people are going to go where they're going to go, so it's very possible they end up walking down the road anyway. Um, and what we propose, again, in conjunction with the location up here, is to be able to separate that out and say, regardless of what woods road or otherwise goes in there, it's going to be a created trail conjunction with the trail that you see in the yellow area that will indeed take people and say, well, you may use it anywhere, this is specifically the trail that is created for you. And we'd like to do it for that. Dave, can I follow on that? Sure. So what you're suggesting is within that 50-foot right-of-way that the Sprague will retain, or they can do it basically what they need to get access to their property, yes. regardless of what broader rights the town has in that 18-foot strip. I mean, is, is that the way that easement's going to come, is going to fall out to, uh... Basically, they have the right to uh, retain vehicular access, access or ingress and ingress to their property. Because you're, you're granting that to them, yes. well, in theory, if this all plan, plays out, other than what they have by this 12-foot uh, easement. Right. What I'm getting at, Peter, though, is that as a citizen of the town, we really don't have a legal right, except on the right of way, that, that we had deeded for the as a as a conservation easement. Technically speaking, we don't really have the right to go on Sprague's property. Is that the case, Maureen? Is that the way you would read that? Well, we don't have the right to go on any property with without. I mean, except for the usual traditional 
town emergency access rights but we don't have the right to go on any property without public access easement i believe this is what we're talking about that extends from the turnaround is on the property of lot A. So it's not owned, the fee ownership in the land would go to the, to the lot A. The Sprague Corporation would have an easement over that 50 foot area. I do not believe the easement is what you would call an exclusive easement, which means that the property owner could convey the same rights to other people in the same area as long as those rights did not conflict with the rights they had granted to the Sprague Corporation. So you could grant a right to the Sprague Corporation to traverse back and forth there, and you could grant a right to anyone else as long as you hadn't exclusively granted it to the Sprague Corporation. Good, yeah. Yes. Now, Dave, were you saying that you don't know that this proposed easement gives the town no. citizens uh, the right to go from Lot A over to the existing Greenbelt Trail? No, what I'm just saying is that, that um, as I see it, that section that's not shaded in or in between those two green ones, if, the, if one of those happens to be, let me back up. All I'm saying is that as a citizen, I wouldn't want to walk on the Sprague area if I knew that the town had an easement for the Greenbelt Trail across the property in a specific area. So I think it's important to me that the landowner has agreed to improve and make a clear trail across that property for us. And we should not be con concerned at all about Sprague's right away other than the fact that we know it's there. Okay? And, and, okay. and what I was getting at is I, 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 I think that the, the, the property owner has gone quite a ways to, to do this trail. I want to add a little f further to that and what Peter Carter said. I don't know how many of us sitting in this room today would be willing to spend the kind of money that he is willing to spend for that improvement of over 500 feet of trail and to argue about 14 feet to me uh, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. He's, there's a, quite a bit of expense to build that trail and improve it with the, with the fence, the trees, and all the other improvements that he's done. And uh, I, I don't know how many of us would be willing to spend that kind of money to well, do but, this. But we're giving up what we have already. I don't, I don't want to see that get lost in the discussion, Dave. No, I don't. I, mean, I, don't, I, don't. I, I, I acknowledge that completely. I mean, I truly commend the applicant for going that far, but it's not like they're putting it on the table. They're putting it on the table in exchange for giving up something that, you know, I think is we have to look at, at as a town very, very carefully before you surrender an easement right like that. I agree with you also, Peter, but the thing that I have to agree with Mike Pulsifer is that I have a hard time walking down somebody's <laughs> driveway to a right of way. And I think this is a, a significant improvement for the town. Hey, Mr. Chairman, I uh, would uh, personally love to see the access to the Greenbelt Trail moved the way the applicant has proposed, I, ex with one exception. Uh, I have used the easement where it exists now, and I, I don't like walking through what appears to be someone's yard. And I think because of that, a lot of people, a lot of people just aren't using it. Uh, the only uh, concern I have is the location in that 50-foot wide easement where you have it marked in dark green and light blue. I mean, if the applicant would agree to put it where the light blue path is, I think it would satisfy the Conservation Commission and perhaps we could find a way, I think as Barbara suggested, to figure out a way to avoid the imposition of a fee on the open space issue. Uh, and I don't know how best to do that. I don't think any of us are interested in connecting the Greenbelt Trail across all those wetlands uh, to interfere with uh, Mr. Kennedy's uh, building of a home or enjoyment of that property. And perhaps if we could figure out a way to preserve that as open space and not undermine the spirit of the ordinance, um, then perhaps the applicant would be willing to put the easement to satisfy the, what the Conservation Commission has uh, proposed. And Maureen, I don't know if there's any way to do that. I mean, I don't think we need to have a, a path necessarily going across the entire length of the property, necessarily. Uh, perhaps it just goes, the access is, allows uh, ingress or egress uh, in 50 feet into the property, so you can look at all this open space but not necessarily uh, traverse the entire section. 
Is that feasible? I think, I think given the, the variability of opinions that we seem to have here, the amount of time we've spent on this last month and tonight and the current hour, uh, I think we have a couple of choices. We can continue to wrangle over this and do this design on the fly that we get caught in sometimes. We're effectively being asked to review and approve an application for which we don't have specific plans. Uh, or we can send the applicant away with some very specific homework assignments, table this for one month, come back and see if we can wrap this up fully. And uh, personally, I, I would advocate that course. So I, I did hear the Conservation Commission chairman say that, there, that further compromise was certainly an option, and I'd certainly like to see those folks have a chance to get together and, and come up with something that they both agree to. Mm -hmm. uh, also, regarding the open space, there seems to be some question as to the viability of open space versus fees, and I don't know that we're in a position to decide that right now, this moment. But I'm sure there are other folks who have opinions. Mr. Potter. Mr. Chairman, I'm not in favor of tabling the issue. Uh, also, in regards to the two locations of the turnaround at the, where it takes a sharp left-hand turn, that from the applicant and that from the Conservation Commission, I believe it's not a point worthy of discussion because we all know that sometime in the next decade the Sprague Corporation is going to build a road within their right of way to gain access to that property, perhaps even to sell it. And when that happens, the public, being the public, is going to walk right up the damn middle of the road. <laughs> Shank. I, I would like to make clear from the discussion that I've heard that I don't think that the Conservation Commission is just standing on ceremony about this. I think they're saying what they're saying simply because the land to the south is drier than the land along the property line, and that's the crux of it. And I really think we can satisfy people if the applicant and the abutters will just say, okay, go ahead in this 50-foot easement. I don't think you can do much with the easement anyway. Go ahead and put the trail in the southern section. It's the spray, sprays have the right, as Peter says, to build on it. And the, the question about the open space, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I certainly don't want to impose any additional fees on the, on the applicant. I think he's doing a great deal by improving the trail the way that he is. And if we can come up with a solution that works for everybody, satisfy the zoning requirements, but still satisfy the applicant. I'm just wondering if the applicant wants five minutes or so to confer and, and perhaps come back to us with their responses to some of these proposals or, or whether that would be productive. I mean, the problem with tabling is we're just going to put this work off for another day. David, you just read my mind. <laughs> Chairman, if you don't mind, if we could, uh, certainly up to you, if we could have, I don't think you call it a recess, but uh, five minutes uh, break, as it were. Exactly. Three minutes it is. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. You know me. Thousand square feet of open space in this section of property. Come right down here. We will uh, allow a uh, or create an easement so that members of the public that would coincide with the current easement, the current proposed easement, so that members of the public can actually come over here and, and get into the wetland. It's not like you can't step there. It's just you know the wetland, so they can certainly access it from your public ability. And uh, we will acquiesce to the. The blue line as shown on here, which is the 18 foot wide easement on the southerly side of that 50 foot wide easement. Mm -hmm. And as a condition of approval, we will, <coughs> show, we will show that on that mylar, no subsequent plans. Um, the meets and bounds description of the 40,000 square feet, which is in excess of 37,500 square feet, to be required. We will show the connecting easement four members of the public in this section to the trail, literally right across from it. And we will create the 18-foot wide easement that connects to the current trail, uh, as you see it in blue. I believe that takes care of the issues. <laughs> Comments from the board?
I have a motion to make when you're ready, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield to Mr. Sherman. No, I, I, uh, my initial reaction is I would be in favor of the proposal as outlined by Mr. Fisher. Any other comments before we consider a motion? Just one comment, just to be on record, that uh, I know we didn't talk much about the 18-foot waiver on the road, but I'd be in favor of keeping it or allowing them to have it. I think I'd add one condition, and that is if, if it reverts to a town road, it'll have to meet town standards. I think there's a note in here from the town engineer. Would that not be included with any? Yeah, please. There is that a, should the, appear on the plans. There is a note on the plan, I think, number 15, that, oh, that that's fine. commits to that. Mr. Cotter, if you're planning to propose a motion, I presume that you would strike condition six, yes. the motion we have before us. Mm -hmm. Place that with the. Uh, I rewrite. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Condition six on the second page. Right, and then you would be adding mm -hmm. a couple of conditions about 40,000 square feet with these locations. On six on page six. Mr. Trump. Fisher. We have a request um, to uh, just confer with my client very quickly if you, before the motion is seconded, if you don't mind. Please, by all means. Thank you. motion with me? We'd like a moment to clarify something before we have a motion before us. Oh, okay. I thought it was before the second because we wanted to hear the substance of the motion. That's the way I understood his comment, but they left, so. <laughs> Mr. Fisher. Mr. Chairman, our apologies to the board for the, uh, the time delay, but uh, we stand by our immediate best uh, proposal. Thank you. Mr. Sherman, do you have a comment before we entertain a motion? Well, I mean, I did say earlier I'd be in favor of this proposal because it seems like a worthwhile compromise, and we certainly appreciate the applicant's willingness to move the uh, greenbelt access to the southerly section of that 50-foot easement. Uh, I guess my concern remains, and I asked the town planner, uh, the open space that's being uh, preserved along with the easement, is that worth anything? And, and what I'm trying to figure out from the applicant is, is there a true access to that the 40,000 square feet, or is, it, is that all wetlands? Or is there any dry uh, access way for members of the public to access that open space? Actually, the comment depends on how much it rains. There's an RP2 wetland that's actually not too far off the mark. As you know, when we were out there recently, um, probably the better part of at least five months out of the year, if not frozen, there's not a whole lot of wetland. It doesn't pass the, the get your feet wet test. And with the spring runoff, which is actually the first time we delineate, we delineated this wetland twice, or went back out to chuck it in the dry uh, scenario, which is August. August, September time frame. We started it purposely uh, a couple of years ago uh, in conjunction with, with everyone. Um, but uh, 
Suffice it to say that it has an RP2 wetland. There's no ponding out there. Uh, during the winter months, you could walk across it, ski across it, whatever people wish to do. During the spring runoffs, that six to eight week period, you can still go there. You might want to wear bean boots. But uh, throughout the summer, uh, and for instance, the drought conditions that we experienced the year before last, uh, this week when we first started the wetlands, we did the wetlands based on the hydric soil content, but you're not, you wouldn't get your feet wet at all by having walked back in there. So again, that comment about it depends on how much it rains is literally true. Uh, in a downpour, you're going to get your feet wet. Typically, at a normal time of year, uh, you avoid the pockets, the, the, the pits and mounds. And uh, yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, just to clarify that a little bit, because I had the same question. Uh, from what the town planner said, typically in a case like this, there's a, a permanent dry edge that's also conveyed so that if people can't access the land itself, they can access the view of it. And I don't believe, from what I'm hearing, that that dry edge is provided here. Um, it's purely just the wetland that's being offered up. Well, not purely. I mean, we've got the area right in here, which is nice, high, and dry. Can you get all the way back into here without getting your feet wet in the month of late March or early April? Probably not. Throughout the other nine to ten months out of the year, very probably. Um, I think we're getting, we're trying to go forward with the art of compromise as much as possible. Understood. Thank you. Okay. Maureen, would this typically go back to the Conservation Commission to review the proposal to uh, provide for the 40,000 square feet of open space? Well, well, typically, when a subdivision is proposed, there's an open space component. And that is always reviewed by the Conservation Commission. And one of the things they always pick up is where there are no places for, I mean, the Commission usually likes to have trails that are outside of any wetlands, RP1 or RP2. They usually also go out and check the area that's being offered so that they can verify that it, in fact, is dry and it's a valuable piece. So that they have, since there's no open space plan, the Commission hasn't reviewed it. I don't mean to put Mr. Duddy on the spot, but I'm just wondering if he has any thoughts about the, the <laughs> compromise that has been proposed tonight. I think the planning board is, would be interested in the com, uh, Conservation Commission's perspective on this. Um, I understand that the Commission hasn't reviewed it, so I can't speak for the conserva Conservation Commission as a whole. You may want to have each of us get up and give our thoughts because I really want to be respectful of the commission process. I will speak if um, the planning board wants me to as an individual member of the planning board, but it, I, I cannot represent that it's our position. Individual member of the planning board, um, I think this is a, re is a reasonable compromise that's being struck. But that's my own individual impression. Thank you. I'm wondering, would the other members of the Conservation Commission be willing to chime in? Recognizing you have not had an ample opportunity <laughs> for you to say. Well, more importantly, would anyone care to take a differing view? I see that. Are, are there seven when you, on your board? Are there seven of you? Again, well, then we've got a majority here. <laughs> I, I want to be respectful of the process. Again, yes, there are seven of us. Um, there are four here. There are three who have not yet even heard about this issue. I'm speaking personally. There's been no vote taken, and a review has not occurred. But just to give you some feedback, because it's late, and everyone's put a lot of time and effort into this. Um, but I cannot find the commission, uh, the conservation commissioner, speak on behalf of those who aren't mm -hmm. here. Fair enough. Thank you. Mr. Cotter, did you have a motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I do. Motion for approval. Findings of fact. One, K and K Realty are requesting minor subdivision review of the Golden Ridge Lane subdivision, a three lot subdivision located off Route 77, which requires review under Section 16-2-3, minor subdivision review. Number two, the application depicts a buffer strip with tree and shrub plantings, but does not specify number of plantings, species, or minimum size at time of planting. Three, the proposed pedestrian easement location has been revised, and the easement document should be revised to reflect the changes. Four, the proposed 
pedestrian easement will replace an existing pedestrian easement that currently has a marked Greenbelt Trail. Five, the road maintenance agreement needs to be revised to reflect the sole responsibility of the applicant to maintain the road. Six, the application substantially complies with Section 16-2-3 minus subdivision review. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted, the application of K&K &K Realty for minus subdivision review of Golden Ridge Lane, a three-lot subdivision located off Bowery Beach Road, be approved subject to the following conditions. One, the plans be revised to reflect the comments of the town engineer in his letter dated 12903. Number two, that a planting schedule for the buffer strip be added to the plans which details the number of planting species and minimum size at time of planting. Number three, that a pedestrian easement be submitted for the location approved by the planning board in a form acceptable to the town attorney and signed by the applicant. Number four, that the planning board recommends to the town council that the existing pedestrian easement not be extinguished into a green belt trail and installed in, in the new easement which has been inspected for compliance with the approved plans by the Conservation Commission. Number five, that a revised road maintenance agreement be submitted in a form acceptable to the town attorney and signed by the applicant. Number six, and I'm very willing to listen to recommendations or changes in this. Number six, that the applicant agrees to offer to the town 40,000 square feet of open space with easement Number seven, that there be no sale of lots, no issuance of a building permit, no recording of the subdivision plat until the plans have been revised and the above conditions have been satisfied. Let's second that motion. Thank you. Does anyone have any suggestions for clarification or addition to conditions or findings of fact before we get into the discussion? I always yield to the two attorneys on the court. <laughs> and then rightfully so. That's why we put them together so they can confer with each other for three minutes. <laughs> the only thought I had was specifying where the, the general location of the 40,000 square feet. And my understanding is it's essentially a strip along the, the is that the southerly edge of? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> we'll make it continuous That's across the entire width. Of the southerly edge? And what's the lot? Is it lot Opposed A? Lot C. lot C. How about if that condition were to read that the applicant offers 40,000 square feet of open space along the southern edge of proposed lot C with a connecting easement? Thank you. <laughs> is that clear enough? Should there be a finding of fact about this new broken picture? Is that how it's clear? I just wanted to note that the candy maker just outdid the two attorneys. There you go. <laughs> and it's Christmas season, too. It's time of year. Would, would one of our illustrious attorneys uh, like to make a suggestion to reinsert finding of fact number six uh, to refer to the need for open space rather than a fee? Since we're having a condition that relates to that, we should have a finding of fact that generates that condition. You were doing so well, I why would you need that? I mean, it's, it's being offered as open space. It complies with the regulation. I'm not sure. Why would you need to specify it any more than that? Because we're being very complete and thorough these days <laughs> for the purpose decision. And well, something along that. the lines of the applicant has specified in its plans a 40,000 square foot area on the southerly, uh, on the southerly edge of lot C as open space. Could you say that, say that again? I'm afraid I can't. <laughs> Please try. Maureen, How about we just take under findings of fact number six, the applicant needs to provide open space to meet the open space standard. Okay. Is, it's a substitute for all the other verbiage. Well, this is under the findings of fact, not under the oh, conditions of approval. So. Okay. Mr. Cotter, Mr. Griffin, are you comfortable with, with proposing and seconding the motion as rewritten? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Now, any discussion? Just, just so I understand the process, the town council still has to approve uh, after the town attorney's been through the actual grant of the easement, because you've got to new, do new deeds, as well as the surrender of the old uh, easement that the town has. Is that, is that, and where, what's the timing on that? 
once we they get approval tonight and when does it go to the town council I guess given all the iterations here I'm, I'm kind of interested in monitoring that process just to see and, and I would recommend to the applicant that they not approach the council and until they've got all these conditions met okay because I think the council may ask that question so that they ought to be ready to record the the actual subdivision plan which means they need to meet all these conditions sure so you've got a lot to do in 90 days and at that point they can then approach the council and ask for acceptance of uh, the new easement conditioned upon relinquishing the old easement when the new trail has been installed I guess that's my so that's right. we'll still have that easement until it's actually built out no that's up to the council all, all the planning board has done is make a recommendation and that's that's my question thank you any other discussion about the motion before the board I'd just like to say from my perspective I'm pretty uncomfortable with the open space as proposed I think it's fairly valueless and I absolutely agree that the applicant has done a wonderful job of trying to create a new access way which is buffered and landscaped and delineated and does a good job of satisfying the needs of the applicant and still trying to maintain access for the, the folks in the town and just not real crazy about 40,000 square feet of nothing that you can't even go walk along and look at I appreciate the Conservation Commission members speaking individually and not as a commission in the spirit of compromise supporting that and I intend to vote for this motion but I have to do so with a little bit of uh, distaste just because I think we could make better use of open space in the town having said that I call the question all those in favor please indicate so by raising your hand it's unanimous thank you you have your approval thank you very much I move and move we adjourn motions and made for adjournment Second. all in favor Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>